Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to pursue uh, our global brainstorming over the crisis that uh, the world faces today. We are dealing right now, uh, and we try to do it on an interactive discussion uh, amongst our distinguished panelists, the issue of uh, climate diplomacy, the crucial need for a new dynamic. Uh, we will have a plenary closing session on the global failure of diplomacy on all these aspects, and I believe that uh, climate diplomacy and the issue of the climate is uh, not only a problem, but perhaps also a solution. Uh, to be able to discuss uh, this issue, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, starting with uh, His Excellency Mr. Bill Ramel, who was the former Minister of State uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, he's from the Labour Party, uh, and you held the, the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defence and uh, the Higher Education uh, Ministries. Uh, it's obviously uh, a range of uh, experience that uh, you have covered, and I think these will be critical in, uh, in today's debate. You are currently the president of the University of Kurdistan, uh, and so that's, that's definitely, you know, uh, providing us with uh, an approach that uh, from, from either sides of the, of, the, of, of the topic, of the scale, the global scale of the problem. Uh, next to you, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Lubna Buarfa, founder and CEO of OCRA in the United Kingdom as well. So uh, you are obviously a Moroccan citizen, as well, I suppose. And uh, you are leading artificial intelligence uh, specialist, entrepreneur leading a company that uh, looked at how artificial intelligence has impacted uh, uh, life science uh, data and uh, how actually the processing of the data could enable a leap to be uh, carried out on uh, tackling uh, the effectiveness of the of the health sector. We've seen how important that uh, it would have been in the COVID. I, pass in, I talk in the past because I hope that lesson have been learned in that regard. And the idea here is to see how your knowledge could contribute to the current crisis of uh, global diplomacy in trying to tackle uh, climate change. Uh, next to you, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Joseph Adelagan, former uh, founder, sorry, founder and executive chairman of the, at the Global Network for Environment Economic Development uh, Research. Uh, you're obviously a citizen uh, of uh, Nigeria, uh, professor of uh, civil and environmental engineering. I'm glad that environmental engineering uh, got uh, associated to both civil engineering and I hope that mechanical and electrical engineering also are part of the solution, which we will be pleased to discuss here with a variety of uh, of uh, panelists as well, coming from the industry and private sector. Uh, you've got three decades of uh, distinguished uh, professional uh, experience in uh, uh, 20 African countries. So you have a broad range of experience uh, uh, over the issue and uh, of solutions for uh, climate change and the problematic of uh, implementing uh, adequate diplomacy to get them uh, rolled out. So your experience also ranges beyond Africa into Asia, Europe, and North America, and you're currently uh, also involved uh, at the United Nations, with the United Nations, and ECOWAS, and uh, dealing with investment and development. Next to you, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Ugo Trambali. You are a senior advisor at the ISPI from the Italian uh, Re Re Republic. It's an institute and you're in charge within that institute of the India desk. You're a veteran journalist. You have witnessed most of the recent 30 years crisis, war zone, and so it, it's almost anticipating on uh, what is expecting if uh, diplomacy fails, climatic diplomacy uh, notably, because we know that uh, climate change will uh, probably uh, induce significant uh, uh, crisis, if not uh, wars over critical resources. And you also have an experience uh, into the transitional uh, phases that country have uh, gone through, uh, ranging from uh, India, Pakistan, uh, South Africa, Russia, uh, China, the rise of China. So those are all uh, transformative uh, 
uh, processes that have uh, had uh, consequences over the state of global affairs and current diplomacy. Welcome among us. Next to you, I'm happy to introduce Monsieur Jawel Kerdoudi, le président de l'IMRI uh, du Maroc, donc uh, uh, un institut uh, que vous avez fondé, uh, un think tank, uh, qui est uh, financé par ses membres. Donc uh, je vous félicite pour uh, cette initiative. Vous êtes professeur de relations internationales et vous avez commencé votre carrière à l'Office uh, de commercialisation d'exportation à New York, il me semble. Et uh, de ce fait, uh, on aimerait savoir... Uh, de par votre expérience, qu'est-ce que finalement euh, la position euh, à la fois euh, du Maroc pourrait euh, contribuer à, à débloquer la, la, la diplomatie internationale et euh, dans le cadre de la diplomatie internationale et l'expérience que le Maroc a eue récemment euh, avec la COP22, euh, j'ai le plaisir d'introduire, pardon, de présenter euh, Saïd Mouline, directeur général de l'AME. Donc euh, Saïd est un euh, professionnel de l'énergie, vous étiez conseiller du ministre de l'énergie il y a de ça je pense plus de 25 ans, vous avez ensuite euh, intégré euh, le, le centre des énergies renouvelables en essayant de trouver des solutions, vous étiez directeur technique, vous êtes passé par le secteur privé, ensuite vous avez repris euh, une, une, une agence qui a été boostée avec les énergies renouvelables et l'efficacité énergétique que vous avez menée depuis, et on voit que finalement, il euh, y a aussi euh, l'efficacité énergétique qui est un petit peu ce grand absent du débat. Mais surtout, on va noter, on va compter sur votre rôle en tant que euh, responsable des partenariats publics privés euh, dans l'organisation de la COP et voir de quelle manière ces partenariats pourraient et de quelle manière finalement le secteur privé interagit avec, le, avec, le, avec la diplomatie climatique. J'ai également le plaisir euh, et le privilège de présenter, pardon, je m'excuse euh, du lapsus répété, répété Monsieur Mohamed euh, Hmidouche. Alors, euh, vous êtes actuellement euh, président du Inter Africa Capital Group, basé au Maroc. Votre expérience, de, alors là, on parle d'une expérience euh, euh, encore plus large euh, au sein de, du multilatéralisme, Africain en particulier, vous avez été chef de cabinet du président de la Banque africaine de développement, vous avez été derrière le développement de nombreux projets en Afrique, le financement de ces projets notamment, et la genèse en fait de ces projets, et, et ça serait très intéressant de voir de par votre expérience euh, sur tous les pays africains, euh, à, à différents échelons du multilatéralisme, comment finalement... Euh, de la genèse, est-ce que donc, euh, ces projets sont générés par des solutions ou la diplomatie mène à des solutions et cette dynamique serait très intéressante à voir au niveau du continent euh, Bienvenue parmi nous. Euh, J'ai le plaisir de présenter Yusra, Dr Yusra Aburabi, qui est spécialisé, euh, spécialiste pardon, en relations internationales à l'Université euh, internationale de Rabat. Vous avez une expérience euh, sur euh, les politiques, finalement, euh, les politiques climatiques qui sont menées dans le cadre euh, euh, multilatéral et global. Et vous avez bien entendu une expérience euh, focalisée sur la diplomatie euh, aussi bien nationale qu'africaine et la coordination finalement de cette diplomatie dans le cadre des négociations euh, en cours pour essayer de casser un petit peu ce, ce blocage international que nous vivons aujourd'hui sur la diplomatie climatique. Et last but not, certainly not least, we have uh, Mr. Raphael Obonio. Obonio, uh, you are a contributor at the Diplomatic Courier and you come from Kenya. We had the privilege of uh, hosting your former prime minister on a panel on uh, Africa, not being listened to uh, and uh, non-aligned Africa. And it's interesting to see that uh, the impact on the climate change is the most striking in that regard. And uh, uh, you come as a political uh, analyst, uh, a published author uh, who co-authored a number of books on the topic. And we are very happy to have you. You are an advisor and expert uh, at the United Nations, the World Bank, and a number of multilateral organizations. So we have a... a a panel of uh, div diverse backgrounds, and we're going to be able to talk for uh, about an hour and 20 minutes over the issue, try to make the session as interactive as possible. We're on the roundtable format. We would have loved to take questions, but we're not allowed to take questions from you. So we'll try to get the session 
as interactive as possible in our discussion, and I apologize for this format that is imposed, but those are the rules of uh, today's session. And uh, basically, I'm going to introduce, uh, by the way, myself, I'm the managing director of the Sarah Wind Project. It's a regional project uh, aimed at uh, deploying a solution that involves both North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Europe. And I've been uh, waiting for over 20 years, I think Said Moudid can attest of that, for uh, implementation of a solution uh, to take place with funding from multilateral institutions, including uh, NATO, on, uh, on energy security. And that still is not kicking in, even with the striking crisis regarding uh, NATO's energy security situation, but most importantly, Africa's energy access and uh, uh, climate change challenges. So I'm really uh, almost heartbroken to see uh, through the years that climate diplomacy uh, is even impounded uh, by the current disruptions. Climate agreements are not implemented. We've seen that uh, uh, global warming is knocking at the door. We got the droughts. Morocco is a, a um, striking example of, uh, you know, with a, with a drought that we almost never witnessed before, still uh, uh, pertaining as we are in the month of November, still waiting for, for critical uh, water reserves to be uh, fulfilled, uh, uh, filled. And so the idea here is how can we rethink uh, diplomacy? Is it still possible to talk about international environment cooperation? And I think with that and kick, uh, kick in the debate, we have the privilege to have uh, one of the main actors of the current uh, climate negotiation process because the UK uh, with the COP conference in Glasgow uh, is president of the COP process and will pass it on to Egypt. We know the climate conference is, is going to unfold, is going to be inaugurated in two days' time. In uh, Sharm Sheikh, we know that uh, the heads of states of uh, many countries will attend. We also know that President Biden will personally go there in the midst of the uh, electoral process. So it's to show you that uh, climate change and security uh, tends to hopefully take the forefront of uh, the stage of uh, of uh, the, 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 the most pressing challenges, and the idea is to see whether crisis can actually lead to uh, solutions, and that climate may be one of the elements, climate diplomacy may be one of the elements we can, where we can bring people together. So the UK witnessed some of its history, most groundbreaking changes in the last weeks, with a freshly appointed prime minister from a minority background, reflecting for the first time in UK's history, uh, post-Brexit Global Britain image outreach, most appropriately, I would say. And uh, it was quite astounding to learn that uh, the new prime minister uh, uh, has indicated initially that uh, he would not attend COP27. Not only did he do that, but uh, he said he would also maintain his short-lived predecessor's decision to prevent one of the most, most fervent uh, environmental advocates, your monarch, his Majesty King Charles III, to attend the COP as well. So, uh, honorably, honorable uh, uh, Mr. Hamill, Bill, what do you take from this? Is climate diplomacy a thing of the past or climate issues no longer relevant in your, in your view? Absolutely, can we shut the door so we have, uh, we can, okay, that is great. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the statistics on global warming are dire, but I think need restating to shock us all as citizens, businesses, governments into renewed action on climate diplomacy. CO2 in the atmosphere hasn't been as high for three million years. The planet's surface temperature has increased by around 1.62%. Heat waves are 30 times more likely to occur as a result of climate change. Sea levels are rising three million millimeters a year, the fastest rate in 3,000 years and people have cleared 30% of all forest cover on the planet. And all of that wasn't down to Bolsonaro, but a lot of it was. The challenges posed by the climate crisis are therefore enormous. The repercussions not only threaten people's livelihoods and impair development, but I think they raise important geopolitical questions that touch upon the heart of international politics, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and access to resources such as food, water, and energy. And that causes significant and highly uncertain impacts on societies, undermining human security and increasing the risk of conflict 
and instability. And global inequality is at the core of this challenge. Pakistan, which suffered a monster monsoon, is responsible for just 1% of global greenhouse emissions. Meanwhile, G20 countries between them produce 80%. We've seen catastrophic flooding in Pakistan and Nigeria, record droughts in the Horn of Africa and China, long spells of heat waves over Europe and India, and record-breaking break, hurricanes hitting the, U, the US. So where are we in terms of global climate diplomacy as we head uh, tomorrow towards COP27? Well, COP26 made progress, but not enough. The interventions as well of China and India to water down the commitment to phase out coal, to replace it with the phraseology to phase down coal was disappointing, although it is worth recognizing that that is still the first time that a UN climate text includes specific coal commitments. And we didn't achieve the important milestone of the loss and damage funding facility of $100 billion. There's been political progress in recent years with climate change deniers like Trump and most recently Bolsonaro in Brazil defeated. Although just as they deny climate change, they also deny the results of their elections. In the face of all of this, COP27 has to make progress and I think achieve a new dynamic for climate diplomacy. That won't be helped, and you referred to it, Chair, uh, with leading countries being equivocal about their commitment. And I'm ashamed that initially the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, said he wasn't going to attend COP27. He's now welcomely reversed that decision. But I also think, and you said it's groundbreaking that uh, uh, someone of Indian heritage is now Prime Minister in the UK. And in one sense, that is true, that this is a man who supported lock, stock and barrel Brexit, which is the repudiation of a global role that the UK needs to be taking. Anyway, the fact he's now going uh, is welcome. And we need commitment from developed nations that the global economic crisis brought about by Putin, the end of low interest rates and rampant inflation, will not be an excuse to retrench on green commitments. And within the global climate diplomacy imperative, we need national political leadership in every country. Like in the UK, and I make no apology as a former Labour minister for highlighting the Labour Party's commitment on this, to new green jobs, new green industries, new green opportunities, more offshore wind, more electric vehicles, more new hydrogen power, and more nu uh, nuclear, with a clear commitment to 100% clean power by 2030. All of it driven by new ways of working, the biggest partnership between government, business, and communities ever seen, taking advantage of the fact that clean energy is already cheaper than fossil fuels, some nine times cheaper, all of that intended to be overseen by a new British sovereign wealth fund and overseen by a publicly owned company. We need that kind of political leadership in every nation, explaining the challenge, the price of inaction, the economic benefits of action. And that has to be argued in the right way, with the right tone, the need for personal responsibility and action. Going electric, reducing meat consumption, using cars less, flying less. And we desperately need COP27 to reinvigorate climate diplomacy and action. We need that $100 billion fund. Given the economic challenges, that may be easier to deliver through relative debt reduction or adapting the terms of trade. But both will require vision and political leadership. We I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Bill. Uh, you're talking about $100 billion. I mean, we've been talking since Copenhagen uh, COP, know, from those 100. It. And now, you know, we're talking about uh, providing uh, much more uh, aid to uh, ravaged uh, war-torn Ukraine. Do you think that can have an impact on the mobilization of funds for, for COP? I, I think it's got to. I mean, the, the commitment is outstanding for over 10 years. Um, yes, there are global economic challenges and difficulties, but this has to be a priority if we're really to see this as a shared enterprise. And I made the point about global inequality. Someone like Pakistan only producing 1% uh, of global emissions has been ravaged by climate change. Uh, the G20 producing 80% of those uh, um, admissions. We have a responsibility to support. Let me just turn back to you afterwards. We want to have an interactive sure. discussion. And, uh, you know, w you reach a stage where the uh, climate diplomacy has, has reached a failure to the extent that we have had new phenomena, particularly with the youth, with uh, Greta Thunberg, you know, saying, okay, I'm striking, I'm no longer going to school. And we've seen how that uh, impacted a little bit the public opinions, awareness of uh, the critical need to act on climate. Uh, 
you know, just to look at how serious the problems are, I'm, I'm almost tempted to uh, 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 address uh, Mr. Ugo Tambali. You were obviously a veteran journalist and witnessed the toughest spot on earth, uh, ravaged by disasters, war. You've been in Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, how are such crises reported actually in the media? And uh, can we expect uh, um, an effect uh, of uh, mobilization when you see record floods in Pakistan? And, and how, how, how can the media actually mobilize? Because we're essentially dealing with a failure and a lack of motivation for addressing the early, very early stages of uh, climate change uh, into our planet. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you very much to remember that I'm, I'm Italian, because if you watch all the long list of the panelists and uh, the speakers of this uh, five days meeting, uh, I'm the only one without a nation. It's just my name and my, my institution. And I like it because uh, if I have to define myself, every time I have to define myself, I say that I'm an European citizen born in Italy. And, I would, and I'm stressing it because especially after the final result of the Italian elections last month. Well, uh, to be a war correspondent is not a wonderful job. You know. um, it's a, it's a, the job of a, an unlimited time because uh, you lost your balance because you cannot recognize yourself as a journalist to pretend to be different, to be safer, because uh, you are you are acting to, surrounded by soldiers or militiamen. They are dying, or they are risking to die for their own ideas, right or wrong, but their own ideas. So it's, it's very complicated. You need to stop this kind of job. Otherwise, you you miss to understand that the, 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 the real, the, the, the real issue of the problem. Of course, when you are on a battlefield, uh, you, you don't know what you brief. Um, so it's uh, the issue of a possible, not only a climate diplomacy, but a climate issue. It's, would be, it's impossible, it used to be impossible, and still remain impossible. This is why I believe that, um, the, uh, of course, when we talk about climate diplomacy, the, 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 it exists since long time, because all the, the COPs, it's a nest of diplomacy. We, we will see in uh, something from the day after tomorrow, a gazillions of, uh, of uh, diplomatic initiatives. Uh, but I believe, in my opinion, that, that you will change, uh, that the climate diplomacy will be important when it will, the, the climate will be part for the solution of any problem. When, for instance, climate diplomacy, the climate issue will be, for instance, part of the discussion of uh, uh, nuclear reduction weapons or the solution of Israeli-Palestinians or uh, the, the future of Taiwan or Ukraine, because climate is an important part of every political problem. And so only when, uh, when, uh, when climate will be part, will be recognized as a political issue, it will be easy to call, it will be possible to talk about a real climate diplomacy. I'll give you an example. China recently decided, that China, I want to remember that uh, over China at the beginning of the, this century overtook uh, U.S. at the largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases. And today China emits more CO2 than the entire OECD club put together. So China decided in the, the so-called kind of cold war with the United States, decided to get out from discussion and uh, with the United States on climate diplomacy. It's a bad news, but at the same time, it's a good news. Because uh, for the first time, China is recognized, the Chinese recognize that climate issue is a political issue. And so they are using against the United States in, the, in their own political uh, uh, fights with the United States. It's a, good, it's, a, it's a good step, I have to say, despite, of course, we, might, we need to be worried about the future of this century and the relation between the United States and China. Hugo, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, if I may. Uh, Okay, China is using climate diplomacy, climate, uh, obviously they've done tremendous work on uh, uh, rolling out renewables and making them affordable for the rest of the world, and they have the capacity to do f even further on a variety of new energy technologies. Uh, you mentioned something very um, interesting, you know, the solution uh, on uh, climate solutions could be then uh, a driver for finding uh, uh, speeding, rolling out diplomatic uh, uh, diplom uh, solutions for, for, for crisis. 
I can give you an example from uh, Morocco and uh, large renewable energy transfers to Europe and uh, North Africa providing access. We have a variety of other examples with the Nigeria-Morocco pipeline, Europe. So my point is those projects have taken a very long time and they've been presented. I personally presented this project of 5 to 10 gigawatt to the European Parliament in 2002. And yet we're in 2022 and nothing is happening. So why is that the case? Because, uh, I don't know if I have time to uh, insist on this, because we, we were talking about the climate diplomacy inter on the international affair, on the, on the geopolitics. But we need to think also about uh, climate diplomacy, uh, domestic climate diplomacy. Every country needs to, to deal with the, their own constituencies, their own electorate. So, uh, for instance, uh, according to um, the, 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 the Minister of, uh, of Oil uh, of Abu Dhabi, um, Sultan Ajaber, he wrote that uh, to maintain the global energy security will require oil and gas to remain a significant part of the mix for decades to come. So, uh, but when we, there is another issue very, in, um, an interesting Carnegie, Carnegie is at, in, um, an American think tank in Washington, we have the states, when a, I, I quote, when a state cannot defend its citizens for catastrophe, it will lose a component of its own legitimacy. This is true. But just the last single decade, we saw a gazillions of uh, floods, drought, tsunami, landslide, but uh, uh, no consequence for the government in charge of the security of their own uh, citizens. Because in the democratic countries, for instance, like Italy, at least for a moment, for a while, uh, the government are usually blamed and sometimes they lose the power not because of the damage caused by, by a natural catastrophe, but exactly for the opposite, for the economic cost of the CO2 reduction. Uh, look at Gilets jaunes, for instance, in France. Uh, for the populist parties, the economic cost of the transition is a successful political tool, tool among every, inside every European country. This is why I say that we have to think also a, um, a, a well-balanced uh, uh, climate diplomacy, domestic climate diplomacy. Thank you very much. That's You're a good welcome. lead uh, to uh, our next panelist, uh, Mr. Said Moudin. Uh, Said, you have been obviously uh, head of the public-private partnership. You've been involved in uh, Morocco's uh, technical solutions, uh, institutional solutions, diplomatics frameworks, and in terms of uh, domestic climate policy, taking the example of Morocco, uh, what, what are the shortfalling? I mean, Morocco has done tremendous in terms of uh, uh, rolling out renewables and has tried to lead a little bit on the front of, on, on the climate diplomacy, uh, diplomacy front. And uh, you've headed uh, public-private partnerships initiatives for COP22. You were part of the organizing teams. What, uh, uh, you know, domestic policy, Morocco has conducted it. What, what can be done to try to impact more the globe? What are the shortfalling of global climate diplomacy uh, for countries like ours, like most of African countries that uh, are present here today? Merci, Khalid. C'est avec grand plaisir que j'interviens aujourd'hui. Mais ce concept de diplomatie climatique, il faudrait le mettre dans le contexte des premières COP ont souvent été présidées par les responsables environnement. Les dernières COP ont très souvent été présidés par les ministres des Affaires étrangères. Dans plusieurs pays, aujourd'hui, pour vous dire, le lien entre diplomatie et climat est tellement important et que le contexte, on a bien entendu, cette année en plus, je crois que tous les diplomates ont travaillé sur l'énergie, sur l'eau, sur les, les incendies de forêt, sur euh, la sécurité alimentaire. Le contexte climatique de cet été, plus le contexte géopolitique ajouté, qui qui montre qu'aujourd'hui, non seulement dans le secteur énergétique, l'approvisionnement énergétique des pays, tous ces points sont aujourd'hui discutés au niveau de la diplomatie. C'est pour ça que, quand on parle de diplomatie climatique, aujourd'hui, c'est à ce niveau que les négociations se font, à ce niveau, et on l'a bien vu lors de la COP, même à Marrakech, il y avait une zone bleue, et je parlerai de la zone verte, du partenariat public privé, mais pour mettre en contexte pourquoi le rôle de la diplomatie est tellement important. On a vécu, euh, j'étais à Dakar il n'y a pas longtemps, et euh, il y a eu un débat où certains pays africains, on leur dit, même si vous avez trouvé du pétrole ou du gaz, il faut le laisser parce que ça va à l'encontre des changements climatiques. 
Le continent africain a 600 millions de citoyens sans électricité aujourd'hui. Il y a des pays qui sont en pleine phase de développement. Et s'ils trouvent du pétrole ou du gaz aujourd'hui, il est normal qu'ils l'utilisent. Maintenant, nous sommes dans une transition énergétique. Et le Royaume du Maroc a montré une voie. On l'a montré lors de la COP22. Et le sommet des chefs d'État africains, présidé par Sa Majesté lors de la COP22, a montré que non seulement nous pouvons aller dans le développement avec cette transition énergétique, mais nous avons des solutions africaines pour les Africains. Nous avons des acteurs aujourd'hui sur notre continent qui peuvent proposer des solutions, qui peuvent accompagner dans un esprit de partenariat public-privé. Et c'est là où je viens pour répondre à votre question, le rôle du PPP dans ces changements climatiques et son lien. Et s'il n'est pas supporté par la diplomatie, il y aura des problèmes. On a vécu pourquoi des projets concrets qui ont fait qu'au Royaume du Maroc, on a réussi à avoir les plus bas prix au monde pratiquement liés aux énergies renouvelables. Parce qu'il y a eu une gouvernance. D'abord, il y a eu une vision, une vision royale, qui a donné priorité aux énergies renouvelables et à l'électricité énergétique dès 2009. Nous sommes un pays importateur d'énergie fossile. Et aujourd'hui, nous sommes en train de voir qu'avec les renouvelables, qui sont devenues très compétitives, et bien dit, c'est un mot grâce un peu à la Chine, Hein, qui a fait en sorte qu'aujourd'hui les renouvelables sont devenus très compétitifs. Dans notre pays, c'est la, la façon la moins chère de faire de l'électricité aujourd'hui. C'est avec les renouvelables. Donc dans ce schéma, on voit que les solutions existent, mais que ça nécessite des politiques. Et la vision royale a été que non seulement il y a eu de l'orientation politique pour que ce soit la priorité dans notre politique énergétique, des institutions dédiées, de la gouvernance. Le PPP nécessite de la gouvernance nécessite d'abord de la confiance entre les partenaires, entre le public et le privé. Nécessite la transparence dans les contrats. C'est très important. Et ça nécessite de la gouvernance, le respect de ces contrats, parce que ce sont des projets sur 20, 25 ans, 30 ans. Dans l'énergie, les grands projets sont sur des périodes très longues. Donc il faut absolument, pour que le partenariat public-privé réussisse, avoir ces volets. Ce que nous avons réussi sur un projet, je donnerai un exemple, sur l'éolien, un projet de 850 mégawatts, 17 groupements du monde entier qui ont subventionné. On arrive sur les quatre derniers qui sont retenus par avoir le prix le plus bas au monde, entre 3 et 4 centimes d'euros du kilowattheure, entre 30 et 40 centimes du kilowattheure éolien rendu aujourd'hui au Maroc. Pourquoi Parce qu'il y a eu cette transparence, parce qu'il y a eu cette gouvernance, et c'est ce qui a fait que la réussite du PV. On a, je voudrais ajouter un point là-dessus. Dans notre stratégie, il n'y a pas seulement les projets. C'est une vision sur plusieurs projets, ça donne de la visibilité aux acteurs privés. Donc il ne faut pas avoir qu'un seul projet à proposer aux acteurs privés. Il faut dire que le pays a une stratégie. C'est la chance du Royaume du Maroc, cette vision royale. Et deuxième Alors, point, un côté industriel, créateur d'emplois, le côté social lié à tout cela. Alors pour le côté industriel, on a vu aussi les limites de ce oui. modèle industriel. Il y a l'usine de Pâle Siemens à Tanger qui vient de fermer et qui était liée justement par un cadre PPP qui avait imposé... Euh, un transfert de technologie, transfert d'industrie manufacturière pour ces éléments. Et donc on voit que euh, si on laisse tout au secteur privé sans que euh, le public impose, enfin la gouvernance impose un transfert de technologie, euh, euh, on ne peut pas trouver de solution durable. Euh, on voit aussi, et je vais en parler avec euh, Bill Ramel par la suite, il y a des projets comme X-Links qui ont des solutions pour euh, alimenter euh, les, le Royaume-Uni en une électricité renouvelable la moins chère du monde, euh, permanente et pratiquement à moitié prix que le nucléaire local, euh, et, et qui peut être mise en place beaucoup plus rapidement. Et on n'a toujours pas de off-tech agreement, parce qu'il y a un élément disruptif. Mais ce qui est intéressant dans votre analyse, c'est euh, finalement, en termes de diplomatie climatique mondiale, on voit que euh, ça a été initié par les ministères de l'Environnement, effectivement, et graduellement les affaires étrangères. Euh, je vais vous poser une question entre euh, les trois ministères euh, qui devraient être euh, les principaux moteurs des négociations euh, de c est, c est, c est ce processus climatique, et j'en ai essayé quelques-uns. Est-ce euh, que ça devrait être géré maintenant, à votre avis, par le ministère de l'Industrie, le ministère de l'Énergie ou la Défense Ou la Défense 
Donc, euh, oui, euh, enfin, oui. j'ai moi-même euh, oui. obtenu du, du financement de l'OTAN pour non, sa sécurité non, énergétique non. pour essayer d'accélérer le processus. Donc maintenant, globalement, on est devant une, un état des faits où la défense a failli dans, ce, dans, ce, dans cette transition et on est en train de voir de quelle manière on peut sortir de l'ornière. Oui, quand on voit l'impact d'un problème énergétique sur un pays, je comprends tout à fait le rôle de, de la défense et la stratégie nécessaire pour que garantir un service énergétique euh, aux citoyens, aux industries, aux pays. Et euh, aujourd'hui, les trois acteurs, euh, dans, dans le changement climatique, tout le monde est concerné. L'habitat, l'industrie, l'agriculture, vraiment tout le monde est concerné. Nous avons dans notre pays, pour la première fois, nous avions un ministère de l'énergie et des mines. Depuis maintenant un an, nous avons un ministère de la transition énergétique et du développement durable. Donc pour vous dire que l'orientation qui est faite aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas que le, le responsable, parce qu'au-dessus, il y a la diplomatie hein, qui doit négocier, parce que c'est une négociation entre États, mais tous les départements sont concernés. Le, 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 la, la commission PPP, on avait l'habitat durable, on avait l'industrie durable, on avait l'agriculture durable, la pêche durable, et il y avait, bien sûr, l'énergie durable. Donc, tous ces secteurs sont concernés. L'agroalimentaire, donc, nous sommes dans un schéma où tout le monde est concerné, tous les départements sont concernés. Mais, qui pilote Et c'est pour ça, que quand on parle de transition, quand vous avez un ministère en charge du développement durable, généralement, il est concerné et il maîtrise et les techniques et les actions à mener pour que les projets puissent se réaliser rapidement dans les territoires, dans les pays. Nous sommes aujourd'hui, parce que qui porte après les projets pour les concrétiser On a beaucoup de débats lors des COP. Qu'est-ce qui se passe après Qu'est-ce qu'il y a comme financement qui est mis en place Nous avons réussi aujourd'hui au Maroc à avoir avec toutes les banques locales des lignes de financement pour l'économie verte. Donc je m'excuse, oui. par ordre de priorité, maintenant concrètement, puis, on le, parle moi, je énergie, dirais, industrie, défense. Industrie, je dirais... D'abord, euh, transition énergétique ou développement durable, d'accord Parce que c'est le département qui travaille sur l'aspect solution de ce oui. qui et qui mesure les impacts climatiques. C'est le département qui, qui peut ensuite, bien sûr, la défense, les finances. J'ajouterai les finances parce que la finance verte joue un rôle très important. Tous ces projets ne se font que parce qu'il y a les outils financiers qui suivent. Sinon, il n'y a pas de projet. Et il est très important, je, je le mettrai bien en, en, à, à ce niveau. Ensuite, tous les autres, industrie, bâtiments et autres, tous ensemble. Parce que tous sont... Voilà. D'accord. Et il faut quand même souligner, dans le contexte de crise actuelle, de guerre actuelle, je pense que la défense va commencer à... Surtout avec les premiers impacts des changements climatiques dans des régions, la défense va graduellement, parce qu'elle a des leviers quand même considérables de mobilisation de ressources, pour influencer les politiques publiques, euh, on voit aussi des autres problèmes liés euh, à la sécurité et l'impact de la gouvernance. Hein. On voit avec les changements climatiques les effets sur la migration. On voit l'impact sur les processus démocratiques euh, en Europe, par exemple, le populisme en Italie, en Suède, au Brésil, aux états unis Donc on voit très bien que euh, euh, le concept même euh, d'une si gouvernance peux, est menacé. Si je, peux, si je peux ajouter un point, il y a un volet très important qui s'appelle l'exemplarité de l'État. Si on préconise ces politiques, il faut aussi les appliquer en tant qu'État. Nous avons un pacte d'exemplarité de l'État au Maroc. Aujourd'hui, les bâtiments publics, la flotte de l'État, la commande publique doit tenir compte des changements climatiques. Merci beaucoup. Et je vois que maintenant, c'est la casquette d'efficacité énergétique qui s'est exprimée. Euh, L'énergie la plus importante, c'est celle qu'on n'a pas besoin de consommer. Et malheureusement, on voit que les business models sont orientés vers la production d'énergie verte, mais pas euh, d'essayer de réduire au maximum les consommations d'énergie. Et je pense que dans un contexte de guerre et, et, et de sécurité d'approvisionnement, il y a peut-être des changements majeurs qui sont en train de s'opérer. Euh, au niveau régional, du moins en Europe, euh, je l'espère et j'imagine. Euh, je voudrais maintenant... Uh, I'd like to yield the floor uh, to you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Adelegan. Uh, you're uh, from Nigeria and uh, you're specializing in resilience. Uh, I'd like to take the debate, shift the debate towards the resilience of uh, societies towards uh, climate change and uh, see how, uh, in fact, processes can be uh, stimulated as a, 
as a first you know, response to the effect of climate change and whether these can inspire or influence uh, global diplomacy to provide further resource to that extent. Thank you very much. Once again, I want to thank um, President Brahim again for inviting me to uh, this midday's uh, 14th session. Um, we've talked about climate diplomacy, but when you get down to the root, who is affected? And um, how do we provide uh, alternative solution to, to, to those who are affected? Uh, if you look at it, um, if you go down the line, out of the 10 most vulnerable countries uh, of the world to the shocks of climate change, they are in Africa. And then they bear the rebrunt of the effect of climate change. I would like to give some numbers in terms of what is the magnitude of this effect and the level of financing we currently have and what are the innovative financing mechanisms that we can use to solve this problem and then how we can take our destinies into our hands. Let me just give some numbers. For example, Africa constitutes about 14% of the population of the world. The region contributes only 3.8% of the total global uh, greenhouse gas emission. Only 2% of this GHG are from sub-Saharan Africa. And um, an increase of only 2% beyond the pre-industrial level will give us a loss of about 4.7% of African countries' GNP. If you go beyond 2.5 degrees, we're going to have about 128 million people go hungry and 108 people, million affected by flooding. And we have sea level rise of about 95 centimeter. If you look at in terms of the global climate finance architecture, for example, look at the Climate Investment Fund. His Excellency uh, Rame talked about the 100 billion dollars for climate financing. I've been part of this process for several years. For example, Climate Investment Fund, I've been on the Trust Fund Committee for six years. They have a portfolio of about $68 billion to finance climate mitigation and adaptation across 48 transformational countries. But if you look at the effects of climate change, to adapt to climate change alone for sub-Saharan African countries, you need about $60 billion annually. And currently, the financing level provided is only 18 billion. If you look at environmental economics theory, principally talk about pollution pay principle, that means the polluting countries pay for pollution in Africa. Look I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Just, just in this discussion, uh, to respond to my question, how do you think local, regional initiatives could stimulate uh, or, or put into action, uh, trigger uh, a financial response to try and support concrete actions to try to avert the consequences of climate change. Okay, thank you very much. I'm still going there. The question is that we have a funding gap of about $42 billion only to adapt, not even for mitigation. And this funding cannot come from developed countries because the volume is high, $42 billion annually. Green Climate Fund only has $100 billion, out of which to date they have provided only $10 billion, even with additional resources mobilized, $37 billion. So look at the funding gap. So the only way, the in terms of solutions, if I go to what you have said, is to look at innovative financing mechanisms. For private sector, um, they, are, they are quick to fund mitigation projects because they are bankable. The return on investment is high, but they are less interested in funding adaptation projects. But where I'm coming at is that there actually has been discovered recently that there are certain adaptation projects that could actually be bankable. And then I've worked with developed finance institutions. We have come to understand that there are certain adaptation projects that could actually be bankable and could be private sector driven. But the level of funding we have to date cannot solve our problem. What are the innovative financing mechanisms you can use to fund some of these projects? Number one, we have the sovereign wealth fund. We have that in Nigeria. We have a couple of countries. This is a funding that comes from natural resource uh, savings in each of these countries. We could dive into this. Sovereign wealth fund financing could be a way to fund adaptation projects that could be bank bankable. We have lots of trillions of dollars locked up in pension funds. These are some of the ways we can 
fund some of these projects. We have global climate finance architecture. We have, for example, we have global center for adaptation. They are there. But look at the funding gap. The only way we can go to change the paradigm is to take our destinies into our hands, look beyond the global climate finance architecture. It's not going to happen. $100 billion from GCF is just a drop in the ocean. We're talking about $48 billion funding gap annually. $68 billion climate investment fund is going to do nothing because look at the funding gap, $42 billion, $42 billion calculate that over a space of 30 to 2030. We're not going to solve this problem. But to solve this problem, Africa must take our destinies to our hands, look in-house, look at the ways we can generate funding in terms of, most importantly, adaptation. Like I've said, nine out of 10 most vulnerable countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa to the shocks of climate change, they are in Africa. So how do we solve our problem? In-house solution to solve Africa problem. Later I can talk later with, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you very much. That leads me, before going into the mechanism of projects and architecture of the project, uh, I'll, uh, I will refer to the experience our, of uh, the African Development Bank. But before, if I may, I'd like, and before addressing the role of the youth uh, with uh, Dr. Obonyo, I'd like to yield the floor to Dr. Buarfa. I mean, uh, when you're dealing with the youth, you're dealing with the public opinion, you're dealing with the, a movement that can be transformative in how uh, climate diplomacy can be approached. We've seen how new tools have completely transformed uh, the expectations of our societies in the political sphere, uh, social networks and the internet and, and the expectation, it has rose the expectation of, uh, of the populations. Can, uh, how can artificial intelligence, in your view, uh, lead to uh, address climate diplomacy more effectively? You've, you've seen how you know, data from the life sciences could be leveraged in that extent. How, how do you think your, your experience in, uh, in developing AI and, and, and processing data can stimulate this process? Thank you, Mr. Benhamu. Um, first of all, I want to uh, say that we didn't move from the stone age because we ran out of stone. And we will move from oil not because we will run out of oil, because we will and we are discovering new tools, projects that, for example, you are working on for years. In healthcare, the example of researchers working for years and decades on mRNA, but when the time comes, the mRNA research delivered. That is the inflection point. And I believe 2020 was the year of inflection point on every sector, not just in healthcare, but also on the climate, on education, on every sector. And in this inflection point, things speed up and we see the shifts happening. So for me, one of the important shifts is in climate diplomacy, the, the causes, where is this coming from? Not only for climate change, but also societies and countries uh, going towards the globalization, looking to how can we survive alone as countries. And that is where the multilateralism comes in. How can we find our allies, other countries, that share the same values as us around a decarbonization, that we can work together? Because the big difference between the Stone Age, the oil and the renewable uh, energy sector, is that the old energy, when you need it, you get it. But this new energy, it depends on weather. It depends on natural energy resources. And that's where the role of AI comes in. Being an AI scientist, if I will train an AI to decarbonize the world, it will tell me, eliminate the humans. But that's not possible. So we need both human intelligence and artificial intelligence to solve this big issue. Uh, would you like to pursue or uh, I just would like to, to bring in a little bit the connection between the youth and AI and mobilization of society? What, what do you have to, uh, you know, what, what can AI contribute? We know how algorithms tend to influence and, and push for radical solutions. You talk about the inflection point and uh, yeah, what, so how can we AI, build on that? AI can contribute in different uh, ways. First of all, to, uh, 
to orchestrate the supply and the demand of these renewable energy sources. So for example, to allow us to predict when the energy will be produced by wind turbine or by a, a solar system and allow us to move to this new economy, the fourth industrial revolution, for dynamic pricing, to pay for the outcome. Cheaper prices when the energy is there, expensive prices when there is no source of energy. But also, and most importantly, in the context of climate diplomacy, to help us report on our CO2 emission, using AI to help us predict our CO2 to emission as a, a country, as a sector, as a company, and to uh, allow us within this alliance to all be within the same range of, um, of uh, uh, emission. And we are in Tangier today. We are in Tangier. We are near the Tangier Med, the port. Imagine the future of Morocco under the new transition. Morocco will become one of the major a fuel station in the world. All the big ships will come here to get the green fuel that we have here, uh, that we produce through green energy transformed to hydrogen and maybe from hydrogen transformed to liquid fuel that we can actually do two important things, reuse what we already have instead of producing new things. Reuse the tankers that already transported oil to transport green fuel, ammoniac and methanol. So L Lubna, we have I've, I've been working on, on those solutions on, on hydrogen the and implementing the first wind hydrogen systems in Africa funded by NATO in 2012. So it, it takes time for policy to be implemented and uh, we don't know whether the solution is in uh, uh, energy supply crisis and defense. Is it in uh, mobilization of the general population? We've got a case study where uh, Morocco can supply, uh, as I had mentioned, uh, green, green electrons to the UK, but the incumbent, uh, obviously, uh, utilities don't see a business model in that. So we have a structural issue. We have a defense uh, supply issue. We have a uh, regional yeah. solution emerging with Nigeria and Morocco coming up and say we can supply natural gas to all of West Africa, provide yeah. electricity. What I is the that's missing why, link? Uh, the missing link, I think if you're going to create a whole new structure, infrastructure, it's going to be difficult. But if we use, reuse the uh, existing assets like the tankers that transport oil to, transport the hyd to transform the hydrogen to liquid fuel, and this technology will be available in a few years then the infrastructure is there and we can scale it because the big problem now is to scale. And I think rethinking, using human intelligence to reuse the existing uh, infrastructure is the key and the missing component. Okay, that's the golden rule, scale. The problem with scale is you need massive amounts of investments and uh, you need also uh, to have countries that uh, have a large energy demand wish willing to do that transition, relying on new sources of energy. And then, of course, if you rely on a new source of energy, you want to control it one way or another because your energy security depends on it. So we had a discussion on uh, energy uh, global order, the emerging order yesterday. And uh, the idea here, I'd like to shift again on the urgency of the problem and the perception on how urgent the solution is. And I did mention the financing will be addressed right after Mr. Obonio use mobilization what can africa use do to try and and global use try to unite and 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 change the gridlock on climate diplomacy uh thank you so very much uh moderator Perhaps first before i make my comments i just want to appreciate the many youth in the room but uh, most importantly uh, unlike the previous days when i was on panels and i was perhaps the only one uh, on the panel, but also in the audience. I, see, I didn't see people from my country. Uh, today I'm joined by outstanding young professionals uh, from Kenya who are doing amazing work, not just in climate area, but uh, in, in, uh, on issues of climate change, but also in other areas le led by Shalene Ruto, uh, the team that is here. And we should give them a round of applause, even if this is a very serious uh, Thank you event. very much. I'd Thanks. like to remind to the audience that the person you just referred to is the daughter of the president of Kenya, nonetheless. So <laughs> we're definitely very honored to have you among us in this critical debate. Thank you very much for attending this session. We appreciate it. Thank you and most welcome. Uh, on the issue of young people, of course, we realize, just uh, like I've been saying, that uh, climate solutions require involvement of all sectors. 
but it also required public engagement. And uh, we've seen uh, the face of climate action across the continent, across the globe and in the con on the continent now is largely young people. Uh, that it is young people who are pushing their governments now to take action. Whether we are talking about uh, Greta in, uh, in, uh, in Sweden, uh, whether we are talking about uh, 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 Elizabeth in Kenya, uh, these young people are the ones who are now pushing uh, their government to take action. But they're not just activists or advocates, they're also coming up with different solutions and innovations that they're presenting to their governments in small, in, in small and big ways. And they're saying, look, this is, a way, this is the way we think we can address the issue of uh, adaptation. This is the way we think we can address the issue of mitigation. This is the way we can address uh, uh, you know, the issue of, uh, of resilience. So young people are moving away from just being spectators or passive uh, beneficiaries, and they are now also stepping in the arena and saying, look, we need to take action, and some of the action that we are also taking uh, are here. Because truly, uh, and I think uh, Trambale did say that unless a climate diplomacy is rooted in domestic policies, we might not achieve much, because no one is voted out of office because they didn't address climate change. Not quite, not at the moment. And so we need to make sure that domestic policies realizes the importance of climate action and most importantly, climate diplomacy. Uh, and climate diplomacy is about prioritizing climate action uh, through building strong partnerships and through uh, diplomacy, uh, diplomatic dialogues. Let me just ask you, uh, I mean, Africa's demography is one of the youngest uh, in the world. Do you think the youth in our respective countries can be a threat to uh, governments? Or do you think perhaps the other way around that the youth could be a stepping stone for implementing more bold, uh, ambitious uh, adaptation and climate uh, uh, energy, renewable energy programs to try to break the deadlock and try to get that connection to push the message on climate diplomacy and the youth? I think, I think the youth are providing the momentum and the impetus. Because look, a climate change is not just a threat, it's also a threat multiplier. Uh, if you look now, because of climate change, uh, people are losing jobs. Uh, there is high level of unemployment in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And so it is the youth who can push their governments and for their governments to realize, look, if you do not address climate change, how are you going to create the many jobs that we need? If you look at Africa now, 70% of jobless people are actually young people. Uh, they are looking for jobs. Where are you going to get these jobs if you are not going to invest, for example, in, um, in green energy? or green innovation where we are talking about that can create perhaps the many jobs that are, that are required. So I think youth can be both, um, can provide the momentum, can provide the impetus, but they can, because they are also the majority of voters, they, they are the ones who can more or less threaten their governments or politicians and tell them, look, if you're not going to address this issue of climate change, which actually has direct connections with uh, joblessness, then we might not vote you back to the office. So they can provide the push. Uh, so why, why do you think we do not see that happening thus far? Why, why hasn't it been leveraged on so far? Because for a long time, climate change conversation was at a very high level. It wasn't brought down to the level where young people can see that because of climate change, that is the reason why we are having uh, some of the catastrophic problems that we are, we are witnessing. But that conversation is now uh, picking up. If you go to the villages, uh, like uh, what Professor was saying, you will realize people are now talking about because of climate change, we have the drought, because of the drought, now we are not able to access food, now we are not able to access a certain basic uh, 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 opportunities. And if you, if you listen to most African leaders, including uh, our very own president during the United Nations General Assembly, most of them, uh, were prioritizing climate action because they realized that it is in prioritizing climate action that you are able to deal with multiplicity of problems that you're experiencing, whether it is famine, whether it is floods, whether it is unemployment. And so they are realizing that in tackling climate uh, change, you are going to also address a number of problems that we are facing in our respective nations, but also uh, on the continent and uh, also globally. 
Thank you very much. Solutions, solutions, solutions to problems. Uh, I'd like to remind uh, the audience that uh, the UN, U United Nations Environmental Program is based in Nairobi. So uh, we look forward to have also the view of multilateralism and uh, the implementation of project. And with that, I'm really happy to, to introduce uh, Mr. Hamidouche. And actually, I have just a particular concern. I talked about control of uh, energy supplies and how uh, countries that would fund large projects, how can they secure a framework where they feel like their transitional concerns will not be hijacked like we've seen on the gas supply in, on the continent with a neighboring country that shuts a pipeline, with uh, Russia that uh, has actually led to a crisis where in fact it's even the customer that says, okay, I cannot uh, rely on you anymore because you have uh, using your clout because we have to rely on you on energy transition and you, you want to have demands uh, uh, responded to. So we have a whole range of issues, obviously, that also come with the financing of, uh, of uh, projects, multilateral financing. I think it was the president of Senegal that says the hand that gives is always uh, above the hand that receives. So those are multiple issues that I'd like you to address, amongst others, beyond the role, obviously, of uh, multilateral institution finance in this global uh, climate diplomacy and implementing it. Thank you. Merci infiniment pour votre question. Permettez-moi de rappeler, parce que nous sommes en présence de beaucoup de jeunes, qu'ils soient de l'Afrique de l'Est ou du Maroc ou d'ailleurs, rappeler que l'Afrique n'émet que 4% du gaz à effet de serre, hein, alors que la planète, n'est-ce pas, en souffre davantage. Et notre continent, c'est la région la plus affectée par les changements climatiques, causant des inondations, des cyclones, des morts tous les jours que nous voyons. Regardez ce qui se passe dans euh, la région de la Corne d'Afrique aujourd'hui. Euh, pardon, excusez-moi. 7 sur 10 pays dans le monde sont impactés par le changement climatique, se trouvent sur le continent africain. Et ça nous interpelle tous. Et nous sommes aussi dans un continent où le cadre juridique par exemple, sur une question environnementale très importante, et entrer aux déchets toxiques n'existe pas. Et permettez-moi de rappeler le cas du fameux bateau Probo Koala qui a déchargé des déchets toxiques dans la commune d'Abidjan, entraînant des morts. Et jusqu'à présent, il y a plusieurs, plusieurs dizaines de morts, n'est-ce pas, qui n'ont pas été compensés, etc. Et donc ça, il faut aussi euh, dire que le Nord est responsable de beaucoup de problèmes que nous vivons sur le continent africain. M. Moulin a dit tout à l'heure que pratiquement la moitié de la population africaine n'a pas accès à l'électricité. En 1980, nous avons financé à Bamako un projet intitulé « Centre régional d'énergie solaire ». Il n'a jamais fonctionné. Nous avons construit les bâtiments, nous avons fourni les équipements. Il y a un véritable problème de capacité au niveau des États. Donc, mettre en place un programme de renforcement des capacités des États pour élaborer des projets bancables est une nécessité absolue. Au niveau de la Banque africaine de développement, nous avons lancé une initiative qui s'appelle PPF, Project Preparation Facility, qui permet d'accorder des financements à hauteur de 500 000 dollars ou 1 million de dollars pour commencer à aider les États à élaborer des projets bancables. Le fond vert qui a été installé à Séoul, en Corée du Sud, du temps où le secrétaire général des Nations Unies était sud-coréen, moi je me demande pourquoi on a installé le fond vert en Corée, obligeant les pays africains à voyager jusque là-bas, ça coûte 10 000 ou 15 000 dollars pour faire un aller-retour jusqu'à Séoul pour présenter les projets. Alors, j'ai interpellé une ancienne collègue de la BAD, n'est-ce pas, qui a été nommée directrice générale de ce fonds, pour me donner les statistiques des projets qu'ils ont approuvés. Afrique subsaharienne, zéro. Pourquoi Parce que personne n'a la capacité de soumettre des projets et de lever ces fonds. Donc là aussi, il y a un problème très important. Parlant du multilatéralisme et de ce que la BAD fait, la BAD consacre un tiers de ses approbations annuelles aux projets liés au changement climatique. Et il n'y a pas longtemps, il a été décidé qu'elle abrite en son sein 
le Fonds spécial climat pour le développement en Afrique. Tout est parti de la COP22 à Marrakech, avec le plan d'action, le triple A, n'est-ce pas, qui a été lancé, et les initiatives qui ont été lancées au niveau continental. Et dans ce cadre-là, je me permets de rappeler en tant que citoyen marocain, je n'ai plus la casquette du fonctionnaire international, puis je peux parler de façon autonome, n'est-ce pas Le Maroc fait énormément de choses dans le cadre de la solidarité et en application de la vision de Sa Majesté Mohamed VI. Permettez-moi de donner quelques exemples de projets concrets qui ont été réalisés dans le cadre de cette coopération Sud-Sud. D'abord, plus récemment, à Niamey, au Niger, on a créé la commission... Pardon, excusez-moi. Euh, un centre régional climat qui est basé à Niamey. Donc, il y a eu beaucoup de formations qui ont été faites ici à Rabat en faveur des cadres de la sous-région, de tous les pays du Sahel, pour leur permettre d'être en mesure d'élaborer des projets bancables. Alors, est-ce que les enseignements par rapport au premier centre à Dakar ont été retenus euh, Quelle est la... Bamako, vous voulez dire. Bamako, pardon. Aujourd'hui, ce centre n'abrite que des formations. Malheureusement, donc les recherches qui devaient être faites et l'élaboration des projets n'ont pas pu malheureusement euh, se faire. C'était la coopération allemande qui avait, n'est-ce pas, initié un programme comme celle que la GIZ ou la GTZ fait ici au Maroc, par exemple. Et malheureusement, ça n'a pas donné beaucoup de résultats. Pourquoi Parce qu'il y a aussi cette instabilité institutionnelle et politique qui empêche que les gens travaillent correctement lorsque vous avez des coups d'État, lorsque vous avez des problèmes d'instabilité, lorsque vous avez des risques politiques et sécuritaires très importants, eh bien, les institutions internationales évacuent leur staff. Donc, ils ne peuvent pas rester. Donc, il y a eu donc, un problème de ce genre. Pourquoi ne pas délocaliser alors le centre dans un autre pays où il n'y a pas ces problèmes Mais la CDAO a installé au Cap Vert, un pays qui est situé à 450 km des côtes ouest africaines, un centre régional de la CDAO dédié aux énergies renouvelables et à l'environnement. Donc là, il n'y a pas de risque sécuritaire ni rien du tout, mais malheureusement, ce centre est encore un état embryonnaire, il n'a pas encore suffisamment de ressources. Et je termine pour dire qu'une seule main ne peut pas applaudir, comme on dit, n'est-ce pas Donc les cofinancements et le rôle que la BAD joue pour lever des fonds en tant que catalyseur auprès de la communauté financière internationale, qu'il s'agisse du groupe de la Banque mondiale, de l'Union européenne, de la Banque islamique développement, ou bien de la BADER, les banques régionales aussi, et il y a aussi des initiatives pour le financement de ces projets liés au changement climatique à travers le lancement d'emprunts obligataires. Il y a les fameux « green bonds », n'est-ce pas, qui ont été mis en place, mais la Banque islamique développement aussi travaille sur des initiatives similaires avec la finance islamique, n'est-ce pas, les fameux soukouks que vous connaissez très bien. Donc il y a aussi le soukouk, n'est-ce pas, « green » pour aider les pays, surtout les plus vulnérables qui sont, n'est-ce pas, dans les pays d'Afrique euh, de l'Ouest et de l'Est. On, on va revenir là-dessus euh, dans, dans le cours de la discussion. Il nous reste à peu près 20 minutes. Et, et, et en fait, vous avez soulevé une question euh, critique qui est en fait l'instabilité politique en Afrique et euh, de certains pays. Hein, je ne vais pas généraliser, bien sûr. Euh, et, et, et donc, ça me, je suis presque tenté de, de demander à Dr Yusra Borabi euh, finalement, euh, comment, comment est-ce qu'on peut renforcer les capacités dans les négociations, sachant qu'il y a quand même euh, des cas particuliers de faiblesse On voit des structures qui sont installées avec euh, une instabilité politique, des enjeux entre les donateurs et, et les pays récipiendaires. Donc on a une multitude de crises. Et, et, et comment vous voyez dans ce contexte-là, vu l'urgence de la situation climatique, comment vous voyez euh, euh, le renforcement de capacités dans les négociations liées au climat. Merci, euh, cher modérateur, et, euh, et merci à tous les, les intervenants pour leurs euh, leur commentaires très utiles. Je vais switch en anglais, parce que la plupart des conversations sont uh, is en anglais. Je vais répondre à votre question en vous quotant certains des speakers ici. Someone said that, uh, uh, Mr. said that climate is an important part of any political problem. And then Mr. Moulin said the state should show exemplarity, should be a model. And then I think you said that domestic policies must realize the importance of political actions. And all of these ideas brings us to the same point, is that climate diplomacy cannot be effective in Africa if climate is always 
I'm sorry. Should we uh, can, just the, can the door, door be shut? Thank yes. you. If climate is always be seen as something sectorial, so we have urbanism, we have health, we have security, and then climate change or environments. So it is time to see climate change and environments as part of every problem. As, as the first two speakers said, even in the crisis, uh, the, the security crisis, climate change is fully part of that. So this is the first solution, is to change the representation of the problem. And that doesn't cost any money at all. It, it is about how we discuss the topic. And then secondly, uh, many people in this room talked about financing and investment and the lack of financing, especially in Africa, due to many other structural problems. Now, we can't address that by two things. First, re orient the investments that we already have. A few days ago, the World Bank uh, presented a report at our university showing that in the case of Morocco, Morocco is already investing 30% of its GDP. If it takes only 3% of these 30% that are already spent and put them into transition in all fields, then we're going to change a lot. And this, this uh, this thing shows us that in many fields, we could just start by reorienting the pre-existing financial tools that we have. Now, in order to do that, and in order to have even more investment coming to Africa, because there is if indeed the problem that Africa is polluting less, needs more money, and receiving less money for, for this transition, is now I'm going to answer your question and finish on this point, to train climate specialists. Because environment is seen as a part, as a sector, we are not training, we are not putting enough attention to the educational system that train and form climate diplomats that can have an overview, 360 degrees view, on all public policies and bring to the table solutions that are holistic. Now we are sending to the COPs and to the negotiations negotiators that are either specialists on foreign policy, on security, and that going to try and bring the climate topic into them, or we are sending specialists on agriculture or on, on energy that know very well their topic, but maybe they miss other political issues. We need people in every African country that actually embrace the whole system and the whole problem in itself, and that is, I think, the first, the first uh, uh, issues that we should look at and the first priority. Thank, Thank you. you very much. That uh, leads me to uh, Dr. Kardoudi. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, uh, uh, and I'm going to give you all uh, an opportunity to respond on what has been uh, discussed. Uh, the experience of uh, Morocco's diplomacy, since you have some hindsight over what's been carried out over the years, in the climate issue and on the African continent, trying to leverage a little bit uh, the continent over trying to tackle the crucial need for a new dynamic. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, en tant qu'IMRI, Institut Marocain des Relations Internationales, évidemment, nous nous sommes intéressés à la diplomatie climatique. Pourquoi ben, Tout d'abord, parce que le Maroc subit de plein fouet les effets du changement climatique, que ce soit au niveau des inondations, des vagues de chaleur, des incendies de, de forêt, et euh, dernièrement, le problème de l'eau. Nous avons maintenant d'ailleurs Sa Majesté, dans son dernier discours, à euh, sélectionner le problème de l'eau pour dire que nous devons absolument trouver des solutions parce que nous sommes dans un cadre de stress hydrique. C'est très important. Structurel. Structurel. Et pourquoi l'eau est importante C'est parce que c'est l'agriculture. Vous savez que l'agriculture la, la, consomme 80% de l'eau le, le, pour les, les, les personnes, l'eau potable, n'est que de 20%. Et donc, 
étant donné euh, cette euh, situation, qui a aussi des impacts sur la croissance économique. Parce que nous, nous, nous ne sommes pas encore, nous faisons beaucoup d'efforts justement pour que l'agriculture n'ait pas d'influence sur la croissance. Mais malheureusement, chaque année de sécheresse se traduit par une croissance faible. Je cite par exemple 1,5% de croissance en 2016 après la sécheresse de 2015. Et cette année, évidemment, cette année, malheureusement, nous avons la double peine. Nous avons la sécheresse, mais nous avons aussi la guerre en Ukraine et notre croissance ne sera que de 0,8%. Alors, que fait, et, et je confirme ce qu'ont dit, ce qu dit mon, mes collègues, ce problème du changement climatique est réellement une priorité du roi Mohamed VI et de son gouvernement, à la fois sur le plan interne et sur le plan externe. Alors, sur le plan interne, je voudrais simplement vous dire que... Euh, Alors, pardon, Monsieur Kerdoudi, je, je voudrais passer la parole à, à l'ensemble des intervenants. Il nous reste à peu près dix minutes, donc ça va être très serré. Sur le plan interne, euh, je viens moi-même du secteur de l'agriculture et je suis dans les énergies renouvelables pour, sécuriser, pour travailler sur des solutions durables pour l'approvisionnement en eau par les salements. Donc, sur le plan externe. S'il vous plaît. Oui. Alors, sur le plan externe, euh, que, que fait le Maroc Eh bien, le Maroc, d'abord participe à toutes les institutions concernant le changement climatique. Que ce soit les sommets tous les dix ans, vous savez qu'il y a chaque année, chaque dix ans, il y a un sommet, et le dernier s'est passé justement euh, cette année. Les COP qui, qui ont lieu tous les ans, et euh, le Maroc a organisé justement la COP 22 à Marrakech, nous suivons aussi le GIEC. Alors, pour ceux qui ne savent pas, le GIEC, c'est un groupement de scientifiques qui font des rapports réguliers sur le changement climatique et nous le, le suivons. Et vis-à-vis -vis de l'ONU, le Maroc s'est engagé à diminuer, à réduire ses émissions de gaz à effet de serre de 45 à l'horizon 2030. Alors, il et les a révisés à la hausse. Je termine par, par ailleurs, il faut par, le signaler. Par les énergies renouvelables, le Maroc a fait un effort considérable dans les énergies renouvelables, que ce soit le solaire. Vous savez que la centrale de, 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 de Warzazat de solaire est la plus grande du monde. Donc, à la fois sur le solaire, l'éolien et euh, l'hydraulique. Et donc, euh, c'est toute une politique à la fois interne et externe pour nous sortir de ce fléau. Merci, Merci beaucoup, docteur Kardoudi. On voit aussi le problème de l'hydraulique. Hein. Euh, S'il ne pleut pas, il euh, n'y a pas grand-chose à, à, à stocker en matière euh, à la fois de l'eau et d'énergie. I'd like to give uh, each of you about not more than one minute to comment, uh, if you have a comment on what have been said. I'm, I'm supposed to wrap up the discussion, and I think it is better to have it, uh, to have your take on, on, on every issue, any issue that you think is uh, relevant. I'd like uh, you, uh, Mr. Ramel, to start. Okay, uh, I think it's been a good discussion. What comes through this? is the challenge of politics, and for all of us, it's politics, 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 to make the changes that are necessary and take Could you get the microphone closer so we can hear uh, you? To, to make the changes that are necessary and to take people uh, with us. I think technology, and it's been spoken about elo eloquently, can be part of the solution. We face the populist onslaught where green initiatives uh, are being seen as a curse, and we need to take on that challenge. Two final points I would make. Uh, Raphael spoke eloquently about the involvement of uh, young people. I think there are differences between the advanced world and the developing world. In my country, only about 40% of young people actually vote. And if more of them voted, their voices, you know, compared to over 60, 70 or 80%, if more of them voted, they could be more impactful and influential. And I would actually say 
beware for some youth groups about their campaigning tactics. So, for example, Just Stop Oil in the UK, where they have glued themselves to the road, stopping ambulances getting uh, to meet uh, sick and dying people, risks alienating the very people that we need to be on side within these arguments. Very final point, um, and it hasn't come out in the debate, a lot of this is about geopolitics, and actually the stance and the direction of China, in terms of a China first policy, for want of a better phrase, is one of the most deeply troubling developments uh, in the recent past, and we need to engage on that and tackle it. Thank you very much. Uh, we obviously had a discussion on the geopolitics of energy yesterday, so uh, this is very much a topic that uh, this forum has addressed. Dr. Boafa, I have a, now I have to make sure I'm timing you so that uh, we may be able to have all speakers uh, uh, address this issue. Uh, I think it was a really great discussion. Uh, I think a few key, key takeaways for me. Uh, domestic uh, versus multilateral are both important. If we don't change ourselves uh, in our country, it will be difficult to be part of a bigger um, uh, alliance. Uh, on the second thing, we uh, have an advantage in developing world that we have no legacy to have to move uh, from. We can build, uh, and I call all the youth, uh, the entrepreneur in you to already start engaging. It's not all about money. It's also about creating uh, ideas uh, within a time that there is urgency and to find resources beyond the classical funding resources to build those ideas and to start small and grow big. As supported by technology and AI, hopefully. Uh, Joseph. Yeah, just very short. Uh, I would say that um, the, global the global climate finance architecture cannot fix African problem. Is a drop in the ocean. I've said earlier about innovative financing mechanism to close that gap. Finally, in addition, I think that um, African governments have limited resources. Those resources should not be used to fund adaptation and mitigation projects, but they should be used to catalyze investment and de risk investment to be able to attract private sector to be able to make our projects that are not ordinarily bankable to become bankable. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. That uh, leads me to ask Hugo. So trying to find a, a universal definition uh, at the, uh, of, the, the multi, of the climate uh, diplomacy, the United European Union, which is my enlarged country, uh, stressed necess the necessity of multilateralism because uh, in the 21st century, geopolitics is already building a multipolar system because the, the destructive effects of a climate change doesn't know uh, borders, it's like a, a nuclear explosion. And last but not least, because uh, the energy transition is estimated to need more than $250 trillion of investment in the next 30 years. Not a single company, not a single state can, can, uh, can put this bill. And uh, um, just, just to remember you what happened in, in Pakistan, about 33 million people affected, 900,000 livestock lost, more than 2 million acres and 90% of the crops damaged, more than 2,000 dead, and last but not least again, about 50 million displaced. On the other side of the, what do you say, of the barrier, of the, of the front line, if I can use again this word, we have that while wind and solar accounted for the vast majority, for the vast majority of, of all new, new power generating capacity in 2021, they still comprise only 4% of the today energy mix. So the, the issue is, is a sort of catch-22. We need to find alternatives pretty soon, of course, it's evident, and not to kill the economy essential to finance the alternative. It's a perfect catch-22 for the Thank you for the catch-22 reference. Uh, Jawed, please, the floor is yours. Alors, uh, moi, ce que je conclue sur le plan interne, c'est le problème de l'eau. Il faut lui trouver une solution. Sur le plan extérieur, il faut continuer, bien sûr, à être uh, présent dans toutes les, les, les organisations qui s'occupent uh, du changement climatique et préparer la COP 27 de Sham Cher, qui sera une, une COP très importante, et aussi faire en sorte à ce que les, les fléaux que nous vivons, comme euh, le, la COVID-19 et la guerre en Ukraine, ne, ne fassent pas occulter le problème fondamental 
du changement climatique. Merci beaucoup. C'est une bonne transition euh, sur des crises et peut-être qu'elles seront catalystes. Saïd. Well, just to, like to conclude with one concrete project that we managed to do here in the Kingdom of Morocco concerning the youth and capacity building. It's the keys. For Africa, we need more capacity building, especially in this field. We had the program to help farmers to switch from diesel pump to solar pumps. We first sensitized the farmers. Then we trained young people in the rural areas to size, install, and maintain the solar pumps. Then we convinced the banks, the local banks, the farmer banks, local banks like Crédit Agricole du Maroc, to finance those solar pumps for farmers. We are reaching 60,000 farmers using solar pumps today, 600 megawatts of solar PV developed. Why? Because we did the sensitization, we have the financial support, and we have the people installing and creating jobs in the regions. It's very important that for you young people, we can have this capacity building. We have a training center in Marrakech for all Africa today, helping this training for young people, and we believe that many jobs can be created in this field for our continent. Thank you very much. Bottom-up approach and critical mass. Very well done. Go ahead. Mr. Hamidouche. Écoutez, je suis d'accord avec mon ami Moulin sur la question du renforcement des capacités, non seulement au niveau des États, mais également au niveau des commissions économiques régionales que nous avons, les cinq que nous avons sur le continent. Deuxièmement, je suggère comme solution aussi que systématiquement, pour tous les projets bancables qui ont été préparés, de procéder à, à, à de réaliser des études d'impact sur l'environnement, parce que très, très important, parce que très souvent aujourd'hui, le bailleur de fonds vous pose la question, est-ce que vous avez fait une étude d'impact sur l'environnement ou pas Sinon, il vous rejette le projet. Troisièmement, renforcer la coopération Sud-Sud. On a énormément de choses à partager, donc partager les bonnes pratiques et les expériences positives qui sont enregistrées ici et là. Et je voudrais paraphraser ce que disait Yossala tout à l'heure au sujet de l'éducation des jeunes. Il faut entamer ce processus d'éducation à partir du primaire déjà. Il ne faut pas attendre d'arriver au niveau de l'université. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Yossala. Uh, thank you. I will, I will go on on this, on this flow. There are actually many students here from the International University of Rabat. Please raise your hand. Like some of are reporting, some are just like here to listen, some are taking notes. And that shows just like the strong interest to be trained because there is a lack of training and for them to be able tomorrow to build project, attract funding on very different topic. It could be agroecology, it could be migration and climate change, it could be renewable energy. You, no matter what the field, be able to have, again, I'm repeating myself, this overview of all public policies that are actually negotiated in the climate uh, negotiation spheres from uh, a, with a very solid uh, training and that's the case for Morocco and that's the case for all Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Education and mobilization. Last but not least, Rafael. Uh, thank you so very much. I think uh, for me two things. Uh, of course the climate change effects are quite horrifying but we should see promise in some of the positive uh, innovations and initiatives on the continent uh, in Africa. For example, two things. In Africa there's now a lot of push for renewable energy and uh, African countries are accelerating towards adopting and embracing uh, renewable energies. If you look at Kenya, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Morocco, uh, and South Africa, they're doing very well. We need to build on that. The other momentum we need to build on is, of course, actions by young people. And uh, I think young people are now prioritizing climate action as an agenda. And if in every country you see uh, young people are moving climate action from being at the bottom to being at the top, we need to build on that. And lastly, I think for me, and I'll be at COP27 covering some of the actions of uh, young people, we need to move away from words. We've had a lot of words about what the problem and what needs to be done. I think now it's more about action. And uh, I'm happy that COP27 has been dubbed as implementation uh, COP. We need to see more towards, more movement towards action and implementation. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad. I hope you're going to take some uh, of the discussion points uh, to the COP27. Uh, what has been not uh, really mentioned regarding uh, Kenya, for example, and we had the discussion before, is regional integration. East Africa, we learned, is very well uh, integrated. And I think together, regionally, we can achieve much more than uh, 
then uh, when we took when we take the whole continent as a whole we have to start uh, brick by bricks and uh, east africa is a good example for that matter i'd like to thank everybody for uh, attending this session i would like uh, we finish on time almost a few minutes we cannot take questions as i had mentioned in the beginning uh, this is the format of the of the round table and uh, i'd like you if uh, uh, to raise a round of applause for our distinguished panel and I look forward to uh, having you around also on the concluding session uh, this afternoon on uh, the failure of uh, diplomacy globally and what can be done to tackle this problem. Thank you very much for attending. Please join me for a round of applause.